<laughs> it's, that, was a, that was a nice one. Okay. I'm out here. Uh oh, Richard. <laughs> I'm being called on in my life to love people. So the question that everyone seems to be asking about this moment is why? Why did Will Smith, a man known for his affable and rigidly curated public image, who's never lost his cool, slap comedian Chris Rock, a much smaller, neuroatypical man in the middle of the Oscars in front of a live audience of hundreds and a television audience of millions? All of this on what should have been the biggest night of his career. Will has been a big movie star for decades now but never been well decorated as an actor despite numerous efforts in dramatic roles. Tonight, that was set to change. From his performance in King Richard, Will knew that this was going to be his night to get the highest honor an actor could receive. This night, he would become a part of history and become only the fourth black man to win the Best Actor Award in the near 100-year history of the ceremony. But instead of the night being remembered for this honor, is being remembered for this. For Will smacking another black man for an admittedly bad joke at his wife's expense, and then shouting expletives in his thousand dollar tuxedo in the front row of this decadent award ceremony. A lot of people want to run with the narrative that Will was defending his wife's honor, and they want to celebrate the fact that for once in public, a black woman was definitively defended by a black man. I wish I could uncritically endorse that perception, but I honestly don't think that's the most accurate explanation of what happened here. Will had a lot of much more effective ways to defend his wife. And if you've paid attention to Jada at all in these recent turbulent years, it's fair to say that this type of hypermasculine display is generally not the way she wants to be supported by Will. If you ask me, Will did this because for a moment he lost his grip. Rock's joke about Jada's shaved head, which was a product of alopecia, triggered Will. The now years-long public disrespect of his wife, who has been at the center of various scandals and questionable moments, triggered Will's internal traumas of witnessing his own mother being disrespected and abused and at the hands of his father when he was just a kid. As much as we all suffered under Daddy O's militaristic views of love and family, nobody suffered more than my mother. Each of my siblings remembers that night in the bedroom with me standing there in the doorway. I watched my father punch my mother so hard that she spit up blood. That moment, probably more than any other moment in my life, has defined who I am today. Will has spoken about how he wishes that he could have protected his mother and also how this trauma has continued to affect him now. The joke and the look of discomfort on his wife's face, combined with several years of bad publicity, reverted Will to his childhood. It took him back to West Philly. It's profound that on a night where his ego could have been fed all that it would have needed, it was his id that took over for a moment and ruined everything. Will's breakdown here is significant because he's a famous public figure, but it's not unique. In fact, I'd say it's typical for a lot of black men many whom on the surface seem to have it all together. But for a lot of us, this facade of charisma and affability can hide deep pain, a pain that festers and we just hope we can keep it together before it collapses or before we explode in a moment of self-sabotage, much like Will did here. But it's important to know that this problem doesn't start in adulthood. This moment started in Will's boyhood, as it does for all black men. And that's what I'm going to spend most of this video exploring. And ironically, I'm going to use the reboot of Will Smith's breakout show to talk about. All right, everyone, this one will not be for the faint of heart. Be a little heavy. Be a little heavy today, but it's how it is sometimes. Blame foreign man in a foreign land because as I was initially planning out this video, it was starting to get heavy 
And I, you know, reeled it in a little bit, reeled it in a little bit. I don't feel like doing no black pain shit. I've, I've done a lot of serious videos in a row. I want to give myself a break. But then I went on stream with four men. We want to examine, you know, the forces of poverty across the culture and look how the structural barriers in themselves, you know, create the crime and how the youth in particular react to that and create, right. you know, art out of it and how we in turn um, commodify it. We talking about Belly and we gonna have Shortest. Two movies that epitomize the phrase certified hood classic. Both movies are for better or worse, in some cases a lot worse, known for engaging with themes of apathy and excess in the black psyche and how systemically toxic environments produce a wayward sense of being lost in black Americans. With an explicit focus on the images of boys and young men being caught up in the syndrome of destructive behavior as a way to escape from poverty or sometimes just escape. These films, especially Belly, engage with this sense of purposelessness and rudderlessness that feels endemic to black boyhood and manhood. Both movies give images of black youth and black boys caught up in death spirals of poverty, dysfunction, violence, and self-delusion. A great bit of this can be seen in a conversation in Belly where Nas talks to a 12-year-old drug dealer who had recently committed a possible homicide. This 12-year-old boy, who Nas innately knows is destined for an early death or jail cell, tells Nas he recently shot someone that he's staying low in wearing a bulletproof vest in hopes of surviving before lighting a blunt and inhaling the smoke into his 12 year old lungs. It's a powerful and heartbreaking image that would seem absurd if it wasn't a pretty realistic depiction of the life of some of these black boys in this country's worst communities. But the other problem is Nas's awful response in the film. Just be careful, man. These niggas out here ain't even really worth it. You're an ill nigga, though. I like your style, son. Shorty, I'm a ghost, all right? In your pocket, though. That's you. That's for me, baby. Let's make sure you rise above all this madness out here. It's absurdly bad. Damn, you fucking with guns. Nah, kid, rise above all that. Here. Here's a chain that will make you stand out so your ops or the cops can identify your body. I'm going to Africa, not a particular country in Africa though, just going to Africa. I'm joking here right now because I recognize the absurdity of this moment, even if the movie thinks it's doing something deeper and more profound. But that said, this moment as a whole does hit hard. It brought up a lot of thoughts and stories and events and memories that I had been kind of wanting to avoid and I was avoiding in the initial phase of writing this script. Later in the live stream, when talking about this theme of black boyhood, I brought up the story of Yummy Sandifer and it made me emotional. I don't wanna get into the sad story of Yummy too much. There's gonna be enough sad in this video, but needless to say, it's a scarring story of black death. The type of story that, in my opinion, is told far too often in the name of awareness and while there is some value there the vision of his face on stream there triggered me because i remembered seeing it when i was a little boy his same age growing up in the chicago suburbs he saw joining the gangster disciples as his way out of couch surfing and not having family and not having support or or community and look at look out look uh yeah, I wasn't I wasn't ready to see his face again. Like it's really yeah. it's kind of triggering My bad. because like I was his I'm his age. Or I would be his age. And it was one of the first times where I was old enough to understand just how dangerous the world was for me in particular and the sensational promulgation of these types of images and stories, especially when they're used as entertainment has bothered me ever since I was a kid. And we see that today in certain types of media that just showcases black pain and trauma in an entertainment medium, or even in social media as black trauma and death are constantly shared and boosted by algorithms built to peddle drama. One of the top TikTok trends over the recent months is this beatbox freestyle from Fulio. 
But what most people don't realize is that this list of names that he gives that we're just making jokes about is an actual list of dead black boys murdered in a series of shootings over the last few years in Jacksonville, Florida, where Fulio is from. Because of the brazen disregard for life and the just pure bounce of the song made it dope and made people want to dance along with it indifferent to the reality that it comes from. But that shit is flotto, isn't it? That innate rhythm, that swaggering piano bass riff, just begging for some grimy trap bars and a flow cadence that can really only be done justice by black folks, specifically black boys and men for whom these songs aren't just lyrics, but a report. On numerous occasions, I've referenced this awkward and embarrassing line from IGN's review of Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales. Miles is a wonderful mixture of cultures and languages. The way he leaps off of rooftops and flips backwards to face the camera before falling into a headfirst dive is just full of the exaggerated swagger of a black teen. Exaggerated swag. Aside from being cringe and making for a fun meme for nerds and black nerds especially, this goofy throwaway line has always stuck with me because it underscores just how poorly everyone, including other black people, understands black boys and how shallowly black boys are often presented in the media and how that shallow understanding doesn't end in boyhood. It becomes the foundation for the same struggles in adulthood for many black men. There have been plenty of stories and films that have depicted black boyhood going back to Cooley High in the 70s. There's been good stuff like Fresh and its spiritual successor Dope nearly 20 years later. Mid-tier stuff like The Wood from the late 90s, breakthrough stories about queer boys like Moonlight, classics like The Miseducation of Sonny Carson, etc. But almost all of these stories fall into that binary I've talked about in other videos where we can't see black men as anything in between this idealized image of black masculinity or a hood fuckboy caricature. In media, black boys and men are often depicted with a lack of versatility and nuance. We have gotten a few decent depictions of black men in media over the years, and arguably a lot more recently. But as far as I can tell, almost all of the significant images of black boys are from hood movies or white savior movies, which are also often still hood movies. It's one of the reasons Miles Morales was such an important character because he expanded the range of stories that black boys saw themselves in. But paradoxically, even though we've had plenty of examples of black boys in the media who are living in difficult situations, I still often find an overall lack of understanding and insight into how hard black boyhood actually is, how black boys, whether they are living in abject poverty or relative wealth and privilege feel misunderstood, unseen, unloved, taken for granted and exploited and just kind of hold that shit to themselves. Or maybe they put the mask of exaggerated swagger on so nobody asks them about it and nobody can tell. But what we keep seeing as exaggerated swagger is really just a form of black masculine nihilism or in you philosophy dudes about to jump down my throat about what real nihilism is, I get you but I'm gonna use the term regardless because I don't fucking care. It's not like it matters anyway, right? Nothing matters. One show that I think has always engaged with this sense of nihilism is Atlanta, the FX dark comedy that was created, written, and stars Donald Glover. Atlanta is probably one of the best shows to me in the history of television, like black or otherwise. It's just doing something that nobody outside of David Lynch does with mainstream media. It gives us this surreal, dark, hilarious, and often nihilistic engagement with issues of race, chasing dreams, and black men just trying to survive this absurd predicament we often find ourselves in. But instead of playing up the pain and drama, Glover goes for this Dadaist, almost detached and absurd portrayal of the situation, which is very different than the typical imagery we attach to black men in the struggle. There is no exaggerated swag in Atlanta for the most part. It's just cold apathy. It's the same way I'm sure Chris Rock felt when he was slapped on stage. In fact, although Rock was in the wrong for joking on such a sensitive topic, the casual way that a lot of people respond to his public emasculation and embarrassment is exactly the type of indifference to daily terror that a lot of black men keep in the back of their heads, which maybe makes more sense. Like in the first scene of the first episode, I'm pretty sure the main characters commit a murder. 
And aside from the next episode starting in like a prison lockup because they were arrested but not charged with the crime, there's no looming consequences and it really never comes up again. There's no detective investigating the crime in the background throughout the season. A man is shot and it's never brought up again. It's treated with this sense of casual surreality, which while jarring on a TV show, I think it reflects how it can feel to be surrounded by death the way black men often are. That this constant barrage of awfulness can stop having an effect on you, it begins to feel mundane. If you pay attention, Atlanta is full of black death in fact. For a show that's not a crime drama, people seem to die all the time. And in between it all, Earn, Paperboy, and Darius just kind of float through it all, just focused on surviving, barely interested in finding a deeper meaning in all of it. They just want to get on with their lives and maybe have some good in their lives in the process. But the show has also made a lot of overtures to how these horrors don't just emerge out of the ether in adulthood. They give us examples of how this same detachment starts in boyhood. One episode follows a story where Earn inadvertently contributes to the suicide of a classmate after a bullying incident over fake FUBU. In the beginning of the second season, there's an out of the blue shootout at a Mrs. Winner's restaurant and the boys who commit the robbery and probably don't survive are listening to Tay K when they pull up to order their food. Tay K is the rap artist behind the now legendary song, The Race, which he recorded at 16 years old while on the run for murder. The song describes his current situation and they even recorded a music video in an abandoned home to accompany it. And you can see in this video that these are all children, little ass boys playing with guns and literally running from the law because of people they've killed. And if not for the obviously inappropriate and unsupervised environment, you wouldn't know it. Like, it's just so jarring and surprising that the little boys in the beginning of this episode turn into armed robbers the same way when you look at the video of Tay K and you see this child, you have to reckon with the fact that this child murdered a man and is right now serving jail time for that murder. Look at his face. Look at his eyes. Some of you see exaggerated swag somehow. I see existential dread. I see doom. He never stood a chance and neither did his victims. The latest season's first episode gives us kind of an inception of black boyhood trauma. To summarize it, we meet Laquarius, a young boy who wakes up from a dream loosely based on the real life drowning of the black town of Oscarville to make Lake Lanier in Northern Georgia. And although according to the stories, no black people were purposefully drowned, but the remnants of the town do still exist. If you go to Lake Lanier right now and dive down deep, you can see the remnants of what was an actual town of black people cleared out to make a dam. After Aquarius wakes up from this ugly dream in response to some good news, he decides he wants to dance in class, leading him to a trip to the principal's office and a school visit from his less than ideal mother and an old school grandfather. His grandfather strikes him at the school, which understandably leads to a wellness visit from defects and more poor decisions from his mother lead him to actually be put in foster care and put in the care of Amber and Gail, two very on the nose critiques of white liberal feminism. Amber and Gail proceed to neglect and abuse him along with his foster siblings before Family and Children's Services comes for a visit that seemingly will threaten their whole grift that they got going on, which then leads Amber and Gail to decide that they should commit suicide and family annihilation in the process. Laquarius figures it out and escapes at the last minute, and presumably his escape efforts also lead to the survival of his three siblings as well. He returns home to his mother who, while less than ideal, still loves him in her own toxic way and he is appreciative of this, which all turns out to be a dream of Earn, our main character waking up in Europe. Laquarius' ordeal typifies the callous indifference that systems that are supposed to protect black boys often have towards them. The same systems that failed Yummy Sandifer and countless others. The same system that failed Devante Jordan in real life. If you are a little put off by Donald Glover's usage of a white lesbian couple as the villains in this story, if that felt a little sussy, felt a little odd to you, you should understand that this is based on a true story. If you remember this image of the black boy hugging the police officer, then you've seen who Laquarius was based off of, Devante Jordan, the real life 14 year old boy who sadly did not save himself at the last minute. 
Instead, he and five of his siblings were killed in a planned suicide by their abusive, adoptive white parents after numerous signs that the children were being neglected, malnourished, and abused, including one of the women admitting in open court that she hit the children. That scene at the end where Amber or Gail cries and says, why didn't anybody stop us? That's real. If you go and look up this story, you will ask yourself, how did on so many occasions nobody save these children? Because there were obvious signs. But if you know, you know. In the Atlanta version, the kids survive. But in the real life story, all of them died. And maybe this was a subconscious protective factor that Earn interjected into the story. It's hard to say. But when Earn wakes up, he's just normal. He just casually shakes away the cobwebs of this dark lore. He isn't even phased by the horrors that are currently floating around in his head. It's just a daily thing to him. He didn't wake up in a cold sweat. It wasn't a nightmare. It was just the type of shit that niggas have on their mind all the time. He moves on, presumably to get to the rest of his European trip and manage Paperboy and do everything he can to capitalize on the unique opportunity he's accessed. I've talked before about my time as a teacher, and though I wasn't perfect, I've always been incredibly proud of the way I showed up emotionally for black boys as a teacher. And later on when I worked in the juvenile justice system, etc., I would always find something as simple as physical intimacy and affirmation would sometimes be received with fountains of tears from black boys who hadn't had anyone be tender toward them in possibly years. And some boys were football players so big that they cried on top of my head. Some were school weed heads and D boys that just wanted someone to see good in them. Some were in my class and like reading the things they carry or, you know, Shakespeare or some bullshit one day only to disappear. And the next time I saw them was a mugshot and an obituary. But so many of them had the common theme, not of exaggerated swagger, but of deep and unaddressed pain from loss or abuse or sexual violence, pain from lack and just the struggle that they were forced to survive in order to live. And some did hide that pain through the swagger, some with wit or drugs or escapism or girls or whatever they could muster, but all of them. Even the ones who weren't doing so bad and didn't have so much to hide, they wanted to be seen and seen not as a problem population or as a threat or a sexual object, but seen as whoever they felt like they were internally. If this sounds heavy, it's cause it is. Black boyhood is hell. And I don't think enough people get that. I think a lot of people think they understand that, but they, they don't. And if you talk to like black men who are, you know, old enough to have survived that world without becoming emotional eunuchs, they can tell you that, no, you probably don't get it. And if I keep it a hundred, the fact that so many people think they get it and don't is a part of the problem. A lot of people that purport to work for and with black boys don't know what they're doing. And even those who do, can only do so much because as I've said in other videos, the problem isn't with these boys. The problem isn't with the population. The problem is with the barriers that force the population into the situations that they're in. And we don't talk about those barriers and challenges enough, or we do, but we do it very simplistically and shallowly, often lacking in genuine empathy. And then I saw the first episode of Bel Air. It gave me a little reprieve from that feeling. A lot of people I feel like would love Bel Air are not watching it because they just are against remakes. And I want y'all to know, like, no, go watch Bel Air. It's amazing. It's very different, but it's probably the way a remake or reboot should be from here on out. It should genuinely be a completely different take on a old subject. So while the original Bel Air, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air was a lighthearted comedy, this is a prestige drama. And I wasn't ready for how much the first few episodes would really shake me and give me that drama and have me near tears at times as I had traumatic flashbacks of some of my own experiences in boyhood and many, many experiences I had working with boys in the past. 
while it's not perfect, it's not like a true revelation to give you the best insight ever into this phenomenon. It is one of the most useful, insightful pieces of media I've seen that manages to cover a lot of ground around the challenges of black boyhood, of racialized black males seeking to define themselves in a world that just knows they already have all the information they need to pass judgment. The show gives us a useful canvas to discuss a number of issues I've been wanting to kind of talk about, but also misses some that are still left out. Either way, as we go forward, spoiler warning for most of season one of Bel Air, as of recording, the last episode is not out yet. We'll see if I need to add some addendums for that, but you know. Until then, we just gonna keep it moving. So I wanna start on a light note by giving the show its due as a reboot. As I said earlier, a lot of people aren't watching it and they should. You really need to watch it. To give some background for those of you here that I know aren't relatively familiar, Bel Air is based on the 90s sitcom, The Fresh Prince of Bel Air, a rare version of a highly beloved all black sitcom that was loved both by black and non-black viewers, specifically millennials and Gen Xers. This remake started out in 2019 amazingly as a fan film. A guy, the now show creator, just threw this idea he had on YouTube, hoping it would catch the eyes of Will Smith, and it did. Three years later, and here we are, but it's worth it. It's a very good show. The original show was based on original show creator Benny Medina's real life experiences of going from a homeless orphan and petty drug dealer to moving in with a wealthy white family when he was a teenager and suddenly being thrusted into an elite environment as a poor Dominican kid from East Los Angeles. The show focuses on that culture shock and fish out of water scenario when you take a black boy from the hood and plop him suddenly into a completely different environment. This new version has the exact same premise, but with numerous tweaks and updates to make it more serious and effective as a purely character-driven drama. And to me, it greatly sticks the landing with many of the themes and topics it tries to tackle. The show digs into a few things like class struggle and like generational changes and perspectives on what's right and wrong and what's appropriate for black people, what success and black excellence really is and looks like. Phil and Aunt Viv's marriage has this complex tapestry about how challenging marriage is and that it's never easy even when it seems like everything is going well i love how they updated hillary from being this like really vapid caricature to now being an aspiring influencer which kind of still holds on to some of that vapidness but makes it less just silly and she comes off dynamic although at times naive jeffrey and ashley get interesting updates to their characters to add new wrinkles with jeffrey being this like Fixer, John Wick dude on the low, and Ashley being a baby queer, just trying to figure things out. It's not perfect, but in a world of blackishes, blackishes, blackish is, it's good to find a black show providing solid social commentary that doesn't feel so for, well, it can still, it, it's forced, but it feels less poorly executed. And the core of the show, much like the old show, greatly revolves around the dynamic between Will and Carlton, but with a few tweaks. First of all, Jabari Banks as Will is a revelation. He reproduces certain tics and inflections and body movements and subtle details that the real Will Smith did naturally, just as an extension of his own charisma. And it's almost too perfect. It's impressive, but at the same time, like jarring. If you saw the original show, it feels like exactly the same character is here, even though it's clearly a different person. At the same time, when you think about it, the mannerism and swag of Will Smith is foundational to the exaggerated swag of black men for a generation now. So in a lot of ways, the things that I'm seeing in Jabari Banks' portrayal of Will and saying that he acts just like Will are probably just me seeing the authentic ways in which that character was mimicked and, you know, became an icon for black boys and men since I was that age, since I was younger. In fact, if we're talking about exaggerated swag as a real thing, although it's always been a way to describe the vibrant and colorful nature of black people, it was probably Will Smith who best congealed it into a persona in the mid 90s with his Fresh Prince character. Will's natural charisma and star power was always his best asset. For me, Will Smith has never been a great actor. He's more so been a great movie star. 
Rarely do you see him disappear in a role, although it is possible. But when he gets to just play himself and be magnetic on screen, that's when he shines. It's why he can do whole movies basically by himself. But as I said earlier, he speaks to this exaggerated swag as a facade himself. One that we've sadly seen break down a lot in the last few years. The other thing to know about Will's character is that he's very much a Mary Sue, which is really interesting when juxtaposed against an updated Carlton. Carlton seems to have garnered a strong anti-fandom in just a short period of time because, well, Carlton, especially in the first couple of episodes, is kind of awful. I get it. But he's no King Joffrey, which I saw people comparing him to. In fact, he's not even a villain. But I get not liking him. But to me, he is the most interesting new version of all of these characters. I take on movies, beat me to the punch and talking about Carlton a few weeks ago. And one of the major points that he gets at is that Carlton in the old show is kind of a put upon loser who mostly just rides Will's coattails out of necessity as he's a bit hapless and nerdy and not really working well even in his own element. There's still a lot to the show that is based in their relationship being two black boys and young men from very different backgrounds, but the power dynamic is never in question in the old one. But in the reboot, their conflict is the core of the show and provides more complexity because they're both kind of on the same level, but not. And they explain that through examining how both of these boys experience and project their masculine identity. So to explain, the first thing to let me know I was gonna make a video about this is the way that they show how these boys navigate the persistent challenges of black boyhood as it pertains to trauma and masculine performance. As I've said before, gender performance is compulsory. We are all socialized from birth to exhibit specific traits seen as appropriate and desirable for the gender we are ascribed at birth. Boys do this, girls do that. Boys play with trucks, girls play with Barbie dolls. This is a vast oversimplification of this dynamic and the concept of gender, so I'll leave some videos and links and some other stuff in the description to break it down in more depth if you wanna go deeper. Just understand that Will and Carlton, Trey even we'll talk about later, are all beholden to some permutation of performing masculinity and are all doing as much as they can within their own like sense of self to make that performance the best it possibly can. However, for black boys, this performance of masculinity is further complicated by being racialized as black. So, so much more complicated. What makes it an interesting wrinkle is that Will and Carlton are both leaders or alphas or whatever in their social circle. They're both respected and admired by their peers. Both have a level of success with girls. They have respect in the social circles they run in, etc. Will has a lot of advantages for his particular situation. He's talented, attractive. He has a loving, supportive, and clearly very effective and wise, thoughtful mother who raised him alone. And if there's one thing that I wish could have been updated, it would have been the trope of the absentee black father in these types of stories. While the plight of absentee black fathers in black communities is very real, we are now 20 years deep in research that shows that that stereotype is greatly overblown that things like incarceration and untimely death and a welfare system that requires that many low-income black men either live in secret or apart from their children are much better explanations for absentee black fathers than the typical image of a black man just not caring and leaving his children. There's also substantial research that shows that black men are more involved as caretakers when they're involved with their children's lives. In the 90s, much like today, the trope of the absentee black father is was still very prominent. And I get it because at the end of the day, that is something very salient to a lot of people. That is still a serious issue that cannot be completely ignored. But it's something I think they could have updated or maybe they will and I just don't know it yet because I haven't seen the last episode. So I'm crossing my fingers. And I bring this up because it's myths and images such as the absentee black father, along with all the other negative images like the super predator, the thug, the mindless buck athlete, etc., that are prominent in the headspace of boys at an early age. I would venture to say that before black boys hit their preteen years, they started to realize what the world thinks of them, and it's not a pleasant realization. 
They've seen boys like Yummy plastered on the news as either victims or perpetrators of awful crimes. They've been fed images of athletic glory or entertainment excess as appropriate venues for them to seek self-efficacy and masculinity, often with a heightened focus on negative stereotypes and misbehavior. But they've also seen esteemed images of excellence that can often feel alienating and stigmatizing in their own way, especially if these boys are coming from rougher environments where such high achievement can feel impossible. This cocktail of systemic barriers, negative images, and identity crises lends itself to hypervigilance. In psychology, hypervigilance is a system of PTSD, and it's basically this compulsive habit of constantly seeking out and assessing potential threats around you. And it's very common among black boys, both those from poverty and outside of poverty. It's hypervigilance that feeds Will's poor decision making in the first episode that makes him risk his future and safety in order to maintain a sense of agency and autonomy and power in his neighborhood when he's disrespected by a former peer basketball player who has since dropped out of school and started selling drugs. When this other boy disrespects Will, it's not just some foolish pride that leads to his risky behavior as is often depicted when we see black boys making bad decisions. It's also a sense of fear and dignity. Will is lucky, like I said, he's a Mary Sue, but a better way of putting it is that he's top dog in his community. Respected, adored, all those things I said before. But in a community with toxic agents, this high status is also a curse. One thing that has always frustrated me about the way in which we talk about black boys and the exaggerated swag is that the thing that people miss is that behind that bravado is a person and all that positive attention also attracts negative attention as well. For all the increases in opportunity and positivity that Will has, he also has more pressure, more haters, and more people looking to see him fall. Will knows this, that if he lets this one indignity slide with this other player, it's not just a matter of pride or purely status or his ego, but also the daily challenges that he might face possibly increasing where other jealous ne'er-do-wells will come out of the woodwork to get a name off pulling him down. It's not just a matter of pride for him, but a matter of survival. Will gets to perform masculinity in a way that affirms him and makes him feel secure and esteemed. It's stereotypical, sure, but it's still positive and productive. And the idea of that being challenged and taken away from him requires fearlessness and maybe even recklessness on his part. The other part to this that I wanna engage in is the specter of death that constantly hangs over these boys' head and how they have to very nonchalantly deal with it, which is something that is alluded to later with Trey, Will's best friend, when he visits him in Bel Air, but I'll come back to that a little later. If you found yourself wondering why these two ostensibly good boys would go into a dangerous situation with a gun, it's because they've probably long since adopted a sense of nihilism that is ever present in black boyhood and masculinity, a feeling that death is just around the corner, a feeling that probably has been proven right to them over and over. By 17, Will and Trey have likely been to the funeral of more than a few people they knew personally that died untimely deaths due to violence or illness, and it's not just boys fully involved in street life, but sometimes boys simply minding their own business and trying to stay out of trouble. In fact, sometimes those are the main ones who get killed. So like a concentrated fear of death in a weird way can sometimes be a weakness because it can paralyze you from taking the appropriate action you need to survive in the long term. But let's be clear, there's a line between survival instinct and recklessness. When Rashad, the local D-boy, gets involved, that should have triggered Will's fight or flight instinct, or specifically his flight instinct. Because one thing about surviving black boyhood in the hood is that you need to know the difference between your peers who have something to lose and those who clearly don't. They are the guys unafraid of any consequence and indifferent to the harm they cause others. You often hear it in the way they talk about death and their acceptance of it as an inevitability. If you're really from the hood, you know these dudes probably before you see them or you know it when you see them and you know that those are the dudes you don't fuck with unless you really about that life and Will doesn't quite get this memo. You better use it. Cause if you don't, I'ma smoke your dumb ass. In this line, at least according to the mythical code of the streets, Rashad is right. Will pointed a gun at Rashad. It would have been safer in the long term for him to shoot him than to not, because 
Much like Will is engaged in a constant navigation of his status as a golden boy that can't let people disparage him, Rashad is just as caught up in a similar framework as a drug dealer known criminal. This is also indicative of what must have been going through Will Smith's mind as he walked out on that stage. Having spent the last few years being called a cuck and dealing with jokes about his masculinity and manhood, and feeling like he can't shield his wife from criticism, even though she wasn't necessarily doing her best these last few years either to shield him, this smack on stage was a moment for Will Smith, the real life person, to reclaim his masculinity. And this, this is the first fucking episode, y'all. That's like, in fact, just 20 minutes. You, you know the rest. Cooling out, Max, and relaxing all cool, and just shooting some people outside of cool. Uh, Uncle Belair. And so here's where I really appreciate how they like, make sure you understand that the previous elements of dysfunction are informing the dysfunction that Will is experiencing in his environment. When you hear conservatives and you know Republicans and your Ben Shapiro's wet ass P word talk about black issues with no sense of like logic and they talk about how black culture is toxic and things like that, they will make it seem like if you just like took black people out of the hood, then just all of a sudden with those resources, everything is fine. No, that's not how it works. And I appreciate that the show presents this. It engages with how jarring this type of transition would be. There's a saying that you can take blank out of the hood, but you can't take the hood out of blank. And this is true to an extent. It's overly simplistic. But over the course of the next few episodes, we see Will struggling to adjust to his new environment. And that's because he's developed numerous coping mechanisms for surviving West Philadelphia. And he is untrusting of the good nature and ease of his new family and environment. He's quick to respond to conflict with violence because that is a more appropriate response for the environment he came from. He responds to discomfort by turning on the swag and the charm. When he's faced with police figures, his instinct is to run even when he's done nothing wrong. And the show purposely makes this clear to you. What Will is experiencing is PTSD. There's been a lot of research in cities with high levels of violence and murder rates, et cetera, that shows that there are comparable instances of PTSD in these communities when comparing them to military veterans coming out of war zones. In fact, in some cases, it's even more so. PTSD stands for post-traumatic stress syndrome, and along with the aforementioned hypervigilance, it can affect numerous other markers of mental health, causing anxiety, nightmares, problem avoidance, etc. You see all that and Will. And the exaggerated swag is what's often used to cover all of that up, especially in a boy like Will, who is pretty good at hiding it because of his natural charisma and charm. But thankfully and fantastically, we see how surrounding Will with a great support system, most significantly right now being Uncle Phil, although the remake makes better use of Aunt Viv as well, that support system is what kind of eases him into adjusting to his new life. When Will wakes up with yet another trauma at the news of his friend Trey getting shot, a bullet that was likely meant for him, he breaks down. And I love seeing how Uncle Phil steps in to comfort him not just with strong words, but physically. Similar things happen with Aunt Viv, and it doesn't hurt that he's living with a millionaire and like that transition in real life would have been much more jarring. But the point here is that more than anything, Will and black boys need a covering that allows them to shed the habits and behaviors they've often developed as survival tactics. And this shedding of that survival behavior is an underlying part of why Will fell out with Trey. When Trey visits Will in this episode of the show, he is initially put off, but also amazed by the environment that Will now resides in and is a little frustrated and jealous of Will's newfound access to this world, apart from the threats and traumas that he himself, Trey, is still stuck in. You trying to stay in L.A. forever? No. Oh. Mm. I don't know, maybe. Don't play me, bro. You know. You really trying to turn your back on where you came from? Oh, oh slow down. All I said is I might maybe stay in L.A. Ain't no might maybe to it, bro. I know you. You already made your mind up. 
And I think some people will probably read this as a mere matter of jealousy, being jealous of the money and escaping poverty. But the show gives us a hint that it's a little bit deeper than that. What Trey is jealous of is that Will gets to disarm himself, to take off his armor in a way that he simply cannot. If Trey were to adopt this type of emerging freeness and lightness that Will is exhibiting back in West Philadelphia, it can mean death for Trey, literally. It's hard enough that Will is so talented and special, but now also gotten a free opportunity to escape this toxic environment, an opportunity that coincided with Trey getting shot. It's too much for Trey to handle. When Trey says, Not to me, bro. What he's essentially getting across is that I can't do this with you. I don't have that luxury. I don't have the privilege of shedding the armor that I've spent the last 16, 17 years of my life building. And I need to go back with that armor still intact, which means I need to leave you here. That's what makes that so sad. That said, as well as I think Will is written and as insightful as his character is into black boyhood and the challenges of it, I think the real revelation is Carlton. Carlton from the original show has went down as one of the most beloved black characters in all of TV history and for good reason. He was hilarious, lovable, quirky, but also fiercely loyal and had some great somewhat out of character moments that made you see he was capable of being serious. This Carlson is not making the same early impression. And I think Bel Air realizes this and wants the show to play this relationship up in the same way. They know the audience wants to see Will and Carlson as Batman and Robin again, but they want to make us earn it. And I think that's why Carlson was written in a way to make him so unlikable initially. In real life, I probably wouldn't like a Carlton either, but that's why I think the character is so interesting and well written because Carlton is forcing us to take a three-dimensional look at a black trope and archetype that we know very well, but have never liked very much, which is the Oreo. Black media, hell, black history is full of sellouts, coons, Oreos, whatever you want to call them. I feel like the last decade or so, we've seen a much better deconstruction of this archetype because they become much more difficult to escape. And we've also seen like more of a deconstruction in terms of where it comes from as black people who have had that fly in the milk experience get to tell more stories about what it was like for them growing up and why some of them maybe landed where they are now. That feeling of not being black enough is still not fully fleshed out, but that's a feeling that a lot of black people, nerds, weirdos, etc., have felt at times, especially when they're younger. At the same time, we also see unrelenting examples of this trope in real life and the damage it causes, as there's no shortage of black cell swords and grifters or genuinely talented black folks who have caused harm to the culture with casual, accidental, or completely purposeful anti-blackness. I feel like few things hurt black people and the culture as a whole than the actions of sellouts, which is why as a whole, I think black folks are hyper vigilant about who is and who isn't. It's one of the few things I think black people can attack each other with that stings the way it does. I also think because the sellout trope is so repulsive and radioactive that we don't have many stories that attempt to engage critically with what type of life experience creates a sellout. Candace Owens is the quintessential sellout, just the epitome of a turncoat grifter selling out black people and more increasingly black women with ridiculous buffoonish takes on black issues. A short time ago, Dr. Seuss was loved and we didn't consider Dr. Seuss books to be racist. A short time ago, a performance like the one that landed on the Grammys with um, Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion would have been roundly condemned by everybody. And the people that are getting lost um, at this time are young women who don't know what to do. Appeal to right wing people who don't know any fucking better and pay her well to sell them bullshit that they think we listen to, but we don't. That said, just to be clear, if I had to choose between talking to a white leftist and Candace Owens about black people, I'd also choose Candace Owens. It's actually not that big of and this is because what a lot of people don't know is that Candace Owens had a very 
significant black experience as a kid and an adult and has insights into that experience. Although she chooses to use those insights to be full of shit and sell out black people, those insights are valid. And the absence of analysis to that particular experience, to that trajectory where she went from being a kid who actually had to work with the NAACP as a child because she was being racially harassed at school. That was super anti Donald Trump in her earliest days on the scene. It was your typical SJW 10 years ago, how she ended up being this grifter. I mean, it's not complicated. She's chasing the bag, but there's something to understand there that I don't think, like, I think we know it, but we don't have enough stories about it to add texture to it, to create narratives and discourse around it so that in reality, we can keep the next Candace Owens from happening. There are legions of black children whose parents foolishly believe that the white man's ice is colder. So they seek to raise their children apart from other black people, leaving them isolated in white spaces as the black kid and subjected to immense abuses, both by their peers and by the systems that are meant to care for them. In reality, Carlton is like the best case scenario of that situation. In between the awful bouts of insecurity and childishness, you see some strong character traits in Carlton. He has a sense of justice and benevolence. It's not lost on him that his blackness does mean something that he can't just completely ignore. He wants to be successful on his own terms, which is something that isn't always the case with rich kids. He's a high achiever, despite being surrounded by plenty of reasons to just cope. But you can't ignore that the toll of surviving this white habitus has had on him. And I love how in the last episode, they also attribute some of that to Uncle Phil's ambition because he clearly feels an immense sense of pressure to be the right type of black boy, considering all that he has going for. And this pressure means negotiating with constant offenses and microaggressions, learning a level of discipline and disassociation that has likely been a core factor to him developing his anxiety disorder that is spiraling into drug addiction. And for him, Will complicates this in numerous ways. For one, and here's something to think about as we like think about the Candace Owenses of the world. When we start thinking about those black youth that grow up in all white areas and why their performance of blackness doesn't quite work and we need to be empathetic to what that is. Will doesn't have the same alienating experiences of having to come of age under the white gaze and police's behavior at all times. Going back to my homeboy, foreign man in foreign land, we had a conversation once upon a time about why there's persistent conflict between black immigrants who have an experience primarily in their, you know, all black nation versus us here in America, because they come here and they see the art energy and the way we behave into them without understanding what it's like to grow up next to your oppressors and colonizers, they don't get it initially that that takes a toll and changes you at your core. A similar thing is happening with Carlton. Carlton has to grow up around this all white community who constantly subject him to a sense of otherness. And while I'm sure Will would gladly trade places with him, Will at least got to appreciate the fact that the community that he mostly relied on was also all black and gave him a sense of grounding in a culture that was wholly productive and beneficial to him. And so Will doesn't get that initially. He has no empathy for the types of compromises and sacrifices and traumas that Carlton has had to make probably since childhood. When Will sees Carlton's white friends all singing hot nigga, he responds accordingly as he normally would, letting them know that that won't fly around him and putting Carlton in a bad situation, not considering that Carlton has probably had to make peace with the usage of this word since he was in middle school. Carlton probably reacted the same way that Will is now in the past, but with no real black community to retreat to, he probably had to just let that shit slide. And as crazy that sounds to me, a person that grew up around all black people, I won't front and y'all better not front because I know some of y'all motherfuckers was given M word passes in your communities and neighborhoods because you kind of felt like you had to. I don't know. I don't get it. That shit is not good. But like I'm being empathetic to the reality that had to be surrounding something like that. 
Conflict around the appropriate performance of blackness is core to Will and Carlton's dynamic. But ironically, if you really look at it, Carlton shows much more empathy and compassion to Will's lived experience than Will does for him, which is something I think is true for the greater world of black Americans. Will has learned as a part of his survival strategy in a more hostile environment that compromising his blackness will produce a poisonous sense of self-hate as well as ostracism from the community he resides in. Again, there's nothing black folks hate worse than a sellout. From Rill's perspective, Carlton's compromised Oreo state is repulsive and he responds accordingly. It's not until it's explained to him by Lisa, another black child forced into this space, that he gives Carlton the empathy that he really needs and tries to understand that he's just trying to survive just like Will and that his survival strategy is different and unfamiliar because the environment is different and unfamiliar. Carlton, on the other hand, although very shady on a few levels, appreciates that Will is coming from a different world and is adjusting that Will's hypervigilance is a product of his worldview. In fact, on several levels, Carlton works to get Will to see and understand that his version of blackness is just as valid as Will's, even if it doesn't quite look the same. Hey y'all, we almost made it through the whole video without the need for me to jump in, but I, in kind of going over the final edit, didn't feel like this particular point landed back with the totality of this nonsense. Although it should be obvious that this video is about way more than the Will Smith smack incident. Um, one thing that I haven't heard talk about is the white gaze and how Will Smith in particular and a lot of black men who have become successful, that experience of living under the white gaze is a constant stressor that creates the volatile, sometimes depending on the situation, unstable like breaking point that we saw uh, from Will you know, around a week ago as of today. When I'm talking about the Oreo or the sellout, what I'm trying to get at is that for black people, especially black people who are successful or have made it or black bourgeoisie, black excellence, all whatever code word you want to use for black folks that have um, attained a certain level of socioeconomic status, there is a persistent navigation and pressure to not be like that. And some folks don't care. They just kind of go the full Candace Owens, Herman Cain, insert person here route. And some folks, you know, try to keep a hold of some sense of the access to the success that they've created, but also a sense of loyalty to blackness and the black experience. And the thing I'm trying to get at is that we don't empathize with what it really means to juggle those two intersections effectively and how mistakes are often made. Or even when mistakes are not made, the experience, the pressure of constantly engaging and being under the auspicious gaze of whiteness can lead you to anxiety, can lead you to the type of mental anguish that Will Smith clearly has been going through and with the right stimuli can lead you to breaking down and doing something stupid. That's where we get the angry black man trope from. So I want to make sure that wasn't lost in this particular section before I move on to something else. Back to the video. But that's also because Carlton continuously responds to Will from a place of envy. See, because Will is a Mary Sue and equipped with strong plot armor and main character syndrome, he is inexplicably good at everything. He just comes in the first day and he can take quizzes. He knows how to play the piano. He gets up and does a horrible step, which by the way, don't ever actually do that in real life. Like the motherfuckers will just pull you off the stage. It will not be a good thing for your uncle. Almost everything he does works. Everybody likes him, etc. In real life, all men and boys know that one guy, black or otherwise, who is just insufferably good, good looking, good natured, intelligent, talented, etc. And it all seems to come easy to them. Will Smith is that one guy, in fact. And in a way, Chris Rock is kind of like a Carlton. While Will Smith worked his way up in the rap game and then on TV and then into megastardom, mostly riding his good looks and charisma, Rock went the route of stand-up 
comedian one of the more grueling professions to enter into as an entertainer. Rock has never been leading man material or a sex symbol. And even though he's highly successful, I don't think anyone's ever looked at him in the same way that people look at Will. Will Smith knew very well that he was slapping a man lower on the social hierarchy than him. You can see it in the casual way he walks up, smacks him, and then walks back. He didn't even stop to square up as if he were about to get into a fight. He knew how Rock would respond. He wouldn't have done that to Ricky Gervais, a white man in public, and he wouldn't have done that to The Rock or Idris Elba or other men of his social stature. And if the rumors are true that Will Smith has not apologized to Rock yet for this incident, then it's clear he understands this status as a real thing, and maybe he won't. This dynamic, this power hierarchy, is paralleled in the relationship between Will and Carlton on Bel Air. Or like real life Will Smith struggling to keep a facade going, crumbling under the pressure of white gaze and his own success. Blackness complicates this even more because all of that perfection then also exists within that intersection of racism and misandry, making you feel even more inadequate. It's even worse for Carlton, who unlike Will, has to work very hard to make everyone like him and attain such a high status in his social circles. Carlton has made numerous sacrifices and compromises in order to build the persona he has. And then he sees Will, and he knows Will is just gonna come in and effortlessly take all of it away. And Will knows it too. That scene where Will's in the ice bath, where Will kind of expresses to him like, hey, you know that they like you because they think that you're me. Man, you think you can get in my head? But the crazy thing is, I already set up shop in yours. And it's only a matter of time before this hood niggas running your school. Pulling every chick who mistook your goofy ass for cool and taking up the throne, people make you feel so worthy of. See, Will's form of blackness is the genuine article, the exaggerated swag of a black teenager that Carlton's white peers truly desire to consume. Will is real and authentic. Carlton is a facsimile kind of cobbled together for survival needs from Carlton growing up in this all white environment. And as soon as those white people realize that Will really has the exaggerated swag, Carlton knows that they're gonna leave him behind. And we see this. And I'm happy to get at that in this video, going back to the Candace Owens stuff, but for these boys that grow up in these all white areas that feel compromised in their blackness, they don't really get solid images of blackness to mimic from the media. They may not have the best role models around them. They probably are surrounded by black men and women who are sellouts themselves, or they wouldn't have taken their kids out to the fucking suburbs to raise them among all white people. Stop doing that shit to your kids, y'all. I'm sorry. It's valuable to engage with this empathetically to hopefully keep it from continuing to happen. There's a million Candace Owenses and Carltons around us right now that feel alienated from their blackness and are faced with ostracism from their white peers and revulsion from their black peers. And when these boys also try to manifest a concept of productive masculinity in the process, the shit just becomes a mess. While we may not like it, we have to start engaging with the fact that that particular Oreo flying the milk experience is still a black experience. And that those people need empathy and community even when our blacknesses don't match. We should still call them on their bullshit, still treat the ones that refuse to correct their behavior with the appropriate level of derision. But when they're young, when they're Colton's age, just like with Will, they need support, they need empathy. But again, Carlton and Will are still boys and their reality doesn't get much better when they get older. You just hope that this level of empathy that they're experiencing in the show continues on for the rest of their lives. And sadly, that's not what real life looks like for so many boys. Those that make it that don't end up like Yummy or Devante have to find whatever they can grab onto to pull them out of the miasma that black boyhood is. They have to learn to manifest a sense of self and humanity in a world that is openly hostile at worst and apathetic at best, all while at the same time just trying to avoid an untimely death. I can't speak for other black men on this completely, but I know that for me, I think about death a lot. Like, all I can think about sometimes is how I don't want to die. 
I don't want to die, not just because dying seems like it would suck and I still want to do things. I don't want to die because I want to be there for my wife and children. I don't want to die because that would make my wife a single black mother and I know how the world treats single black mothers. And as unfair as it is to single black mothers, period, right now, if I can live to keep that stigma away from them, that's what I want to do. Death is existential to me, but it's also like, I don't have the words for it, but it feels like whenever I open up Twitter or watch the news or go on Facebook, death and black men and black boys is all I see. Black men dead from random act of violence, black men dead from police shooting, black men dead from cancer, only a few years older than me and in the best shape of his life. Black men dead from the same heart ailment I already actually have. Black men are constantly immersed in images of death and dysfunction, and we're just expected to keep it pushing. We're expected to, much like Earn, wake up in the morning and just go on about our business as if the horrors of the, our reality aren't just dancing in our heads. But this isn't new, like at all, which I need to point out for whatever conservatives might be here that are gonna talk about how like it was better in the good old days before welfare or some bullshit. No, this specter of black death was just as relevant to black people 70, 80 years ago too, except that at the time it was state sanctioned white terrorism that constantly threatened them. Black people got used to the men around them dying and not being around. And it's not hard to see how that lends us to the understanding of the world that we have now. Will and Carlton as boys are outliers in how they manage their traumas and challenges. They have immense wealth and very effective adults surrounding them, but their fantasy space allows for the engagement with these ideas and issues. But in real life, they would probably end up more like Earn and Darius and Paperboy. They will be responding to this impending doom that black men feel like they constantly face with this veneer of aloofness or charisma, the exaggerated swag, or maybe apathy and callousness, maybe just a greater sense of becoming a monster themselves. They'd be casually shooing away intrusive thoughts about death, numerous childhood traumas, survivor's guilt, hypervigilance, etc. And to be clear, this is not unique to black men. This is what poverty and capitalism does to people at the bottom of the totem pole worldwide. You can find this same flat affect that you see in Atlanta, in Southeast Asia, South America, Northeast Africa, Eastern Europe, wherever there is poverty, wherever there is patriarchy, you'll see it. Will says it himself in Bel Air. Every hood is the same. Because the machines all have the same parts and produce a similar product. But I will say, just like that TikTok trend, that for black men and for boys, for us, we make that shit fly, don't we? We make it look so good that people who have no idea where it comes from still want to have a piece of it. They want to embody it. They want to live it. They want to fuck it. They want to kill it. That exaggerated swag becomes the dialect of every hood and ghetto around the world. That same exaggerated swag of a black teenager that is uniquely produced in America somehow has managed to be the dialect of struggle in hoods and ghettos all over the world. Well, you'll see people that have never met a black person in their life reproducing that same energy, that same fashion, that same affect of fuck the world. And that energy that these black boys and men develop in America becomes the iconography of what it means to survive the gutter, to survive late capitalism worldwide. But to give Jordan Remy, who is black by the way, the original writer of that IGN article credit, he did understand one thing. He recognized that this performance of masculinity and boyhood that is directly adjacent to the constant navigation and negotiation with death, it may have close cousins. It may be copied and mimic, but to really embody it, you gotta have the real thing. You really want that exaggerated swagger, you gotta pay the toll for better or for worse. Everybody wanna be a nigga till it's time to be a nigga. And that's all I got for you today. You may have noticed some upgrades. Check out your boy's Patreon. That's how things like this get done. Please help support the growth of the channel. I haven't plugged my Patreon too tough in a while, but I wanted to at the end of this video because the hope <laughs> is that 
it'll be seen that the you know money that's coming in from patreon is helping me to one make content that does not have to rely on chasing you know the algorithm bag which is something i've been pretty successful at so far but you know it has to maintain and it means i can step up production so you know i hope that people appreciate that i hope that this works out well shout out to my new editor <laughs> that's all i got for y'all today peace this video was sponsored by brilliant hey y'all i'm back once again to talk to you about brilliant Brilliant is the online STEM learning platform that changes up your typical online learning experience by getting rid of lectures or textbooks and putting you right into interactive learning experiences for math, science, computer technology, coding, and so much more. I know that a lot of you that watch my videos are students or professionals or parents and any one of those roles or a combination of those roles can have you feeling burnt out and in need of a brain break, which has you staring at your phone on an infinite scroll, whether it's on social media or somewhere else, kind of wasting your time. But imagine if you use that same amount of time to have fun and give yourself a break, but also give yourself a baseline or maybe even advanced education on some of the most complex and important topics around technology today. Brilliant offers thousands of interactive lessons that can either help simplify or break down advanced mathematical or scientific concepts, or if you're already an expert somehow, then it can provide new ways to understand those same concepts, offering better insight or maybe even making it possible to teach those concepts to other people. For example, for me personally, I've been using Brilliant since I got access to it a little while ago, and I've been using it to try to get a better understanding of how algorithms work because algorithms are kind of important for the work I do. It's so much better for me to sit and work through a concept directly as opposed to just reading it out of a chapter book or listening to a lecture on it. So if you're looking for a way to enhance your intellect or give yourself something productive and useful to do with your spare time or maybe even setting up a learning regimen for yourself, if you want access to Brilliant, you can get it for 20% off by following the link in the description below or using my promo code FDSignifier when you sign up. I want to say thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode. I hope you all enjoyed it. Peace. Ooh, my foot falling asleep. Ah! 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 Oh, shit. Oh, God. It is like gone. I can't move my toes. Holy shit. What do I do? Do I need to stand up? Oh, God, I'm getting old, man. It happens so quick. You have a normal body one day, and then the next day, your body just doesn't do things anymore. Holy shit. That was low-key scary. Gotta move that leg every few minutes. Now, every time I hear a car, I move that leg. Ooh. Ugh. I could just get up and move the screen. I could do that. I could do that. But I'm not. Alright. Just gonna straighten it out and just get through this shit. Just get through it, son. Get through it. Oh. I have so much more though.
about to be electrocuted. Uh, let's fall asleep again. Uh.